Good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, making the trek up on this beautiful hill. Uh, th this, this, is, this is kind of my home. This is where I finished my PhD from. Actually, I wrote my thesis in the very famous Damon Room. Uh, incredibly lucky to have been here. And I spent my first 13 years away from India uh, in Boulder, Colorado, in this country. So I have done quite a few things, and pretty much focus has been one star over most others. And since I have been to Ames uh, Research Center, I think I w went with a goal of really using the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial um, mindset to do public-private partnership and fuse science and technology, and essentially came across uh, application of AI to science and exploration. And I, what I call, I entered my uh, brave new world, unlike uh, Aldous Huxley's brave new world, which was very dystopian. Mine is very utopian. In, in the almost three years that I have spent there, I kind of see the vision of AI not at all as a negative utopia, although there are aspects of it that can be misused, but the possibilities that it opens up, especially for um, scientists, for engineers, for exploration, for NASA science and exploration uh, goals. And uh, this, is, this is a domain where we have vast amount of data, and AI is very suited for that. So off the bat, I kind of want to demystify AI because <clears throat> before I actually came on board trying to understand at least aspects of artificial intelligence, I remained agnostic and always thought there was something magical about it, something black boxy about it. But as I have delved into it with the teams, while I don't do this myself, there are teams of early career professionals tackling the problems we bring forward. Uh, it, it's kind of important to think of artificial intelligence as really an enhanced version of statistics that we might call fancy statistics. And because most of us are you know, either scientists or engineers and familiar with statistics just off the bat, it takes away um, some of the sensitivity we have about AI being done kind of away from plain sight, where we can't explain what's going on. I think my talk, this was open. Let me try to open my real talk. I'm sorry, actually, I'm glad I saw this, otherwise. Um, me just a second. You'll get a slight show of me going back to the very beginning. Okay. And so I'm going to start with this particular um, um, picture, which is actually um, kind of the concept here is that in this era, you know, we can digitize anything. You name it and we can digitize it. It can be a DNA, it can be a scent, it can be a flower, it can be a protein. And once it is digitized, it, it's labeled, it's mad, then we can actually train a neural net to look at it. And then that's kind of the very basic principle of AI. And um, what you're going to see here is that we, we are kind of applying this tool essentially uh, to number of samples of materialized loaded into a probability matrix. That's what you're looking at. And this matrix is essentially learning and figuring out whether those two objects, one, whether it's a rock 
or a meteorite, basically. And there is a difference between a rock and a meteorite. Uh, you know, uh, meteorites are very sharp and jagged because they haven't had millions of years of erosion to smoothen the surface, and it's got a black fusion crust. So in that sense, you can use some of these tools to teach your probability matrix or the learner to infer a model to determine uh, once it has certain amount of data, whether it is a rock or a meteor. And that's what we did. This is a real project we uh, ran. So what we did in this case is we put the CNN uh, neural net technique on a drone. And we asked the drone to go actually sample uh, objects uh, in a certain area where we actually put a meteorite sample just to see whether this particular technique actually works or not. So this is doing field testing. It collected about 16,000 uh, data, of which there were uh, one or two real meteorites that we had placed. And believe it or not, it actually was able to really improve our technique of determining meteorites. So it actually positively identified this particular neural net a rock from a meteorite. And what you're seeing here, this red color, that was the meteorite. And the CNN technique actually figured that out with only two false positives out of a total of about 16,000 uh, objects that it uh, looked at. Pretty cool. And this is important. You might ask, why did we do this? This is important because when you get a meteorite, say, from um, uh, an asteroid, and if you're able to sort of collect it very quickly before the meteorite is oxidized, then what you can actually do is you can infer the class type of the meteorite from the asteroid uh, composition that it's coming from. So instead of sending an in situ probe, which you know ESA or NASA has done or attempts to do, which is very expensive, you can rather cheaply determine, you know, where did this meteorite come from, from which asteroid category. So there, there are real benefits to these um, studies. So that's kind of your 101. Um, you basically you can train a neural net to learn to recognize any digitized. Um, thing, which has mathematical label with a pretty high degree of probability. And that's just statistics so far, right? Where it gets really interesting, and that's why this GIF is really fascinating, there are dots, and you know, our, our human mammalian brain can perhaps determine the two and three dimensional figures hidden in these dots. But this is more than just that. These become, you can actually pull out multidimensional structure uh, through inference model by training the data. And, and that's where, and, and that's what this GIF is essentially demonstrating, right? You are working, when you are working with 3D or multidimensional data, then our brain really fails, our sensor, our ability to comprehend fails, and neural net can still pull out uh, information and patterns from that. And of course, you know, when we talk about space, we have vast amount of heterogeneous data. So application of tools um, like AI ML becomes very important. This is just to tell you why NASA got into this business. We collect about two gigabytes of data every 15 seconds, and that's from our currently operating missions, which is over 100 right now, and I never like to say how many, because every other month we are launching one, and in fact, for our community, uh, you know, we are hoping to launch the ICON mission, which has been there in the books and ready for a long time, but that due date is 9th of October, so it'll be yet another spacecraft taking observations uh, in the ionospheric domain. But the point is, we are gathering this much data continuously, 
and handling, sorting, managing this data is a huge amount of undertaking. But imagine what that is when we come to analyzing data. I think we analyze but a fraction of all the data that we collect. So what if we can bring the tools of AI to bear on that? What if AI meets space science in this case? And as I said, it can be science, exploration, engineering. We can apply it just about anywhere because AI is agnostic. It's a tool. And so you can see we have already tackled problems in planetary defense, space resources, on the moon, space weather, heliophysics, exoplanets, astrobiology. There are lots of ex examples. If you go to our website, frontierdevelopmentlab.org, you are going to be able to find this. And this is essentially NASA Frontier Development uh, Lab, where, to be cute, deep learning meets deep space plus public-private partnership, which is new synergies for NASA research. And what I want to emphasize here is without the public-private partnership, what we are trying to achieve wouldn't be possible because the amount of compute resources that is necessary and the short period of time over which we turn these projects um, on uh, requires, you know, you cannot do the experimentation that these early career professionals are doing without having that kind of capability. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I think public-private partnership is a very key component of making this whole process work. Why partner uh, with Silicon Valley? Well, for obvious reason. But, uh, that's where a lot of new tools and technologies uh, in the commercial AI sector resides. We know that GPU power is outstripping Moore's law. Most of you know that. Petascale era of data, we know that too. Algorithm development, which is what is undertaken during FDL, is really 5% of task in the overall context of a topic. Developing inference model is extremely costly. And that's what we get from our partners like Google, Intel, IBM, NVIDIA. You know, we are using their tools, their um, experts who work with our early career professionals to really complete a topic. So this is a lot of resources being spent but not recognized in that sense because a lot of resources are also in kind. Just wanted to, before I go any further, wanted to kind of quickly show you uh, that, uh, you know, even before there was an underpinning for AI, we started this program, which is about four years ago. But this year, in February, I, you know, our president actually issued an executive order on maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence. And there are kind of four categories in here. And as we looked at that pretty, pretty elated and bewildered that, my God, we've been doing pretty much all of it in the last four years. So launched in 2016, we have been addressing first, second, third, and fifth bullets. I'm not going to read that. It's a wordy chart. And you can find this and go through the details of it, uh, essentially. Uh, so th this is pretty significant. We become kind of relevant even without knowing when we started this program. This is very quickly the history of FDL. It's four years old, uh, has been developed as, uh, you know, has uh, uh, developed proven uh, formula for producing excellence in applied AI research. But I would say it's a research accelerator because it is done. The research is accomplished over a very short period of time, like eight weeks in um, um, during the summer months, with a focus on AI explainability to match the quality expectations also of the space industry, not just space scientists. 
FDL has produced tons of peer-reviewed journal. In fact, uh, just last week, um, and it happens to be from our field in heliophysics, a uh, paper was published in Science Advances, uh, looking at solar dynamics observatory observations, and I'll talk about that. Um, it, it, the program is cu currently based at NASA Ames Research Center and hosted and administered by the SETI Institute. So that's kind of SETI provides the glue. SETI can partner with external commercial partners as well as international agencies to take in resources and kind of shape the program. We presently have ESA, Canadian Space Agency, Luxembourg Space Agency um, working with us, and there are already more um, interest from other space agencies. And then, of course, there are other NASA centers uh, that are very keen to participate. And of course, we can't, this is, this is not just an AIMS program, that's where it is managed, but this is something for all of NASA science and exploration. FDL in numbers, it's four years old. Um, you know, there are four space agencies, 12 commercial partners. We host a big workshop called Big Think, which is where we bring both the data scientists and the community of uh, scientists whether and engineers to kind of look at challenge questions and define challenge topics for the coming year so that we know that we are actually uh, pairing the right question with the right data, with the right tools, and bring our industry um, stakeholders. And, and you, can re you, you probably have already read what's out there um, as I'm speaking to you, not going to need to talk about that too much in detail. It's a very successful program so far. The question is why a dedicated lab? You know, there are universities trying to do this. Um, uh, NASA centers are attempting to do this, so why a dedicated lab? And if you look at this chart, that kind of makes it um, clear. There, there, there are some boundaries, actually. Uh, you know, there is the gap between the supervised and unsupervised um, learning methods where, you know, supervised methods are basically data that are tagged and you need a human in the loop to train your ML, ML technique. Unsupervised data is where you have sparse sample of data where you don't have a clear signature of what the output is, yet you're trying to infer pattern from your vast amount of data. It gets much more complicated. You have to work on many different tools and techniques to determine a workflow. And this is where our industry partners become really important because they are experienced, they have the tool sets, and they guide these early career uh, professionals. Besides, cost and talent, I, it, it's very, very expensive. Uh, you know, sort of early career data scientists cost about 140K per year. If you go to a mid-career data scientist, that can very quickly rise to a million dollars. I also mentioned developing the algorithms themselves are really, really expensive. And of course, if you don't work together, whatever the question or domain is with your data scientists, I don't think either side can work on a problem all alone because you are very quickly lost because you don't know what the other side knows. So this interdisciplinary partnership is very critical where we, in any given topic, we bring two domain scientists, two data scientists, and one mentor each who work together through this intense eight-week period to come to an understanding of what they have tackled and what the results are. So there are many different reasons for which I think this sprint approach, this accelerated approach over a short period of time is really successful and kind of hard to replicate in the traditional way we scientists do research. But that doesn't mean we can't apply AI. There are just very many ways and very many topics where we can begin to apply, especially supervised um, uh, methods for extracting science information. 
This is essentially the same thing for many of you who are AI experts can actually begin to see sort of the difference between uh, sort of um, simple democratized data uh, and um, workflow that we have in this corner versus where it gets really huge amount of data, sparse data, um, you know, unlabeled data where you, it's unsupervised. And so there are important questions we have to ask when we are actually selecting topics and they have to kind of really fit all of these categories, you know, problems that require uh, innovation in data pipeline training, and it goes on down there. So choosing the right topic is really um, sort of the most important part of what kind of success you're going to have once you have completed the task. This is the timeline over which we do this um, uh, work that, uh, you know, it, it, it's a full cycle, even though the sprint takes place over eight weeks where we are housing um, all of the early career professionals to actually ta tackle the topic. So this is the period, which is the development phase where we are actually engaging with stakeholder, whether it's NASA centers, NASA headquarters, or industry partners. We prepare for the big think session, which is the big workshop where we try to bring everyone to really discuss uh, the important challenge definitions we'll be choosing for the following year. And then, of course, there is an initial recruiting of mentors, not, not the early career professionals. That's very competitive. And even mentors are competitive. But we at least try to feel out whether there is enough expertise to tackle the question. Then we have set up and kick off. Uh, between uh, sort of end of March to uh, mid-June, where uh, we do research interviews, onboarding, data preparation, because we know what topics we are going to do. We have to house the data. Data has to be ready, really, for the students to utilize. Then we have the sprint phase, the most intense eight-week phase, where the research and development um, goes on, the tech reviews are generated. And again, for each of the team, you can find the tech reviews in the form of proceedings um, on the website that I just mentioned. And then at the end, we have uh, deployment. A deployment can be just really deployment of an inference model, publication of results in uh, peer-reviewed journals, conference and presentations, technical reports, and of course, attending new IPS, which is, I think, like the holy grail workshop for folks working in the AI field. And actually, a couple of our topics have been chosen already for uh, next, uh, next year's um, new IPS. This, don't want to go about it, but very quickly, what it is giving you is a picture of how the topics we have tackled so far over the four years really sort of um, focuses on NASA strategic goals and objective. And if I can read this, it says, understand the sun, earth, solar system, and universe. And then there are three big questions. And for all of you who write research proposals, I know you're always trying to pull from this because you have to show how your research is aligned to the topic. These are all the topics we have done from 2016 and 19. And this gray box here that you're seeing is with uh, ESA. ESA um, so the FDL Europe is actually sponsored by European Space Agency, but particularly Earth observation domain. There is another chart very quickly. This is the, uh, again, uh, program impact demonstrated capacity, but now I'm trying to break it out into science mission directorate uh, component. So how many topics have we looked at in the earth science domain or planetary science or heliophysics or astrophysics? But what you also see is the FDL research result on that uh, left-hand side. Oh. Uh, and then they are addressing kind of different areas, right? So on top, you have, 
discovery with uh, multidimensional data. There is workflow optimization, forecasting and prediction. We have decision intelligence. We have anomaly detection, and we have autonomous systems. So these are kind of some of the broad categories that some of these topics would be binned into. So not everything is science and discovery driven. Often the discovery science is a derived benefit as we are finding out. So after four years, I think sort of the basic components of FDL stands out as FDL is interdisciplinary. If you have to remember anything, that is very important. FDL creates a laser focus. I mean, over this eight week period uh, with huge amount of iteration with a huge amount of GPU compute time that kind of results in the success uh, stories that we are able to get over this short dura duration. And then, of course, FDL is about partner um, expertise, you know, commercial, academic, and space agency partners. It's really together come to create the topics and reap the benefit from this program. So now let's talk about some of the examples that we have undertaken uh, with AI. And one question that immediately comes to mind, you know, we are essentially, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. And with the Artemis program, NASA is uh, leading us uh, into the next era of moon exploration with plans to be there by 2024. And this time, you know, the goal is not to go there and return, but create a sustainability base. And if you are going to do that, you know, how are we going to do that? Those become very, any time you make any place sustainable, there's just lots of resources that we would need to make that place sustainable. So can, can AI help? And so I'm just going to give you an example for only this year's uh, result. And so one of the things we um, thought of is that, um, you know, we want resources, right? Because we can't carry all our resources to the moon. And metal is a key resource required for a lunar base. And metal can actually be deposited in the form of metal meteorites. This is, for example, an iron uh, nickel meteorite, which was, um, found by the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. And similar meteorites have been found on Earth also. So finding a way to detect this metal on the lunar surface would be a significant step forward in our goal of making a sustainable base on the moon. So this was sort of the basic premise of the, of the group. How, how do we get there? This is a crater called Tycho on the near side of the moon. It, it's, it's, it's pretty huge. It's about 80 kilometers across, and, and you can see there's Golden Gate in that circular, um, uh, you know, for size. The kids are always doing cool stuff. They are in San Francisco, and they're living and breathing everything that's uh, there. It's also about five kilometers uh, deep, deeper than Mount Whitney. Now, if you look here at this image, you can't really distinguish metal or a rock on the surface. So we need more data and more information to be able to know where to go hunt for metals. Where do we land our rovers? So this problem was really tackled by really creating six different data set from several different international missions with 12 um, unique instruments that cover different aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, visible, ultraviolet, uh, microwave gravity, magnetic, and thermal, all different kinds of data. And so these data are then uh, combined into a stack that itself is a pretty amazing piece of work. But then we can combine this with elevation imagery that then gives us info as to the you know, relief of the moon or the terrain of the lunar surface. And I'll show you some pictures and you'll see it's, it's color coded. So it will give you, you know, 
uh, a color in the K, K, a color will indicate low, in, uh, one color will indicate low elevation, the other will indicate higher elevation. We can combine it with, um, you know, data of rock and figure out rocky region versus non-rocky region. Or we can combine it with thermal images of the moon and we can determine, you know, high temperature versus low temperature. So it's already a very fruitful tool that this uh, team did. And so this, this is where you can see that these are essentially um, different. So this is kind of using um, elevation map to show whether elevation is high or low. I think blue is high and brown is um, low. The next one shows you uh, a rocky region where red is very rocky and blue is smooth surface, for example. Uh, this is showing temperature map. So red, yellow is hot, uh, green is cooler. And so when the team looked at all of this data, what by combining all of this data, what, what they were by, uh, able to do is they created a data set that is powerful for ML technique for anomaly detection on the moon. So these are kind of the different seven crater scenarios they found, right, from various data set. Some have high visible infrared ratio, some are bright and magnetic like here, some are bright at the center. So, but, but we have created this database and now we are ready to apply ML to this to pull out really anomaly features on this. Now remember, this is unsupervised, right? We do not have any sample of what a lunar metal looks like. We don't have that. So that's what these people are trying to solve. And so what they did, so they apply this, really apply a deep neural net to about 35 uh, terabyte of temperature data. The team realized that temperature is uh, critical for metal detection because metals get hot very easily and we have our own experience with that. And therefore, if we can kind of collect all the data that shows temperature variability over a lunar day and put it through the hopper of a neural net, perhaps we can pull out anomaly uh, signatures. And that's what they did. And what they find is this is, this is kind of what the neural net actually uh, generated. It's an AI thermal in a, um, uh, anomaly uh, strength. This is pretty powerful. This didn't exist before. This came out from the fusion of data and application of AI. This could further be utilized, again, combining other data, but also looking for um, you know, what other measurements we need to make. And if by chance we get a sample where we know that there is a metal, a metal then we can use information like this to figure out where the metals are distributed. Very, very powerful approach. Now, it's not solving everything, but it's giving you a process. So let's go to the next set of examples. Can AI make scientific discoveries? Now, I had no idea that heliophysics would prove to be kind of a ground for doing derived science discoveries with AI. But we were very surprised to see that we are actually learning that AI can learn and discover new signs, maybe not new to us, but AI is doing it on its own and figuring it out. And that's what's powerful. So it's kind of allowing us to gain confidence in our ability to utilize AI. This is a short movie. Just take a look while I'll take a sip of my tea. mostly motherhood and apple pie for most of you who are heliophysicists and know the impact of solar variability in very many forms and its interaction uh, with our uh, technologically vested society, whether it's in the ionosphere, whether it's in the form of uh, transformers or on the ground, 
whether we are doing autonomous driving, it, it's really very, very significant. So what we did next, this was our, one of our very first um, experiment. And we said, we have multidimensional data, multidimensional data problem. Basically, we are trying to combine data from L1, solar wind data, with data that's taken on the surface of Earth or anosphere, uh, magnetosphere, this domain, uh, vastly separated in space, different kinds of data. And the question is, um, you know, can we really use this to predict the KP index? And KP index is kind of uh, the, uh, ground truth for surface magnetic field, something we use essentially to determine the strength of our geomagnetic uh, storm. And so the Sting actually built uh, an AI uh, um, inference model, essentially, uh, to predict the KP index. Now, what happens after that? Um, Sting does what AIs do and learn to predict what the KP index is going to do three hours in advance, which is awesome. I mean, it's, it's kind of expected, you know, shouldn't get carried away. Uh, we could, do, could have done this also with simple, um, you know, um, or simpler statistics, but we are trying to understand the importance of AI and how we can apply it. But it also did something really fascinating. And what this is doing, this list here that you see shows all of the data gathered in order of importance to the model. What is interesting is that the neural net actually elevated some small unremarkable stations on the equator that are in that yellow. And that is actually kind of where Earth's magnetic field bunches around the equator. It, it's a phenomenon called the magnetospheric ring current. So if you are a magnetospheric or anospheric physicist, you already know that. Machine didn't know that. We didn't tell the machine anything. Machine figured it out. So this is kind of a derived science discovery, and we are finding this where we actually, this is something we knew. Now we are finding out areas where we don't know. Fascinating. The following year, what we did is we said, okay, we can predict KP, but can we integrate solar data, geomag data, ionospheric data to predicting, again, you know, something that our da daily technology uh, depends on, GPS scintillation. And in this case, we actually added another uh, set of data, basically created a data-driven model where we are using the Canadian high Arctic ionospheric network data. And of course, I think the result is that we were able to train an AI to predict GPS disruptions one hour in advance. These are all really pretty awesome. But what this is pointing to is sort of really a new domain of sort of space meteorology where we can bring a lot more data. This is just a very small sample of data in a very small region that we looked at. This particular technique showed us that while we can improve our time accuracy, the spatial accuracy is not improved significantly because it's very localized. So the following year, we tried to bring actually it's, this is what we, we continued on that path, but we brought in actually more data. And let me go to the next one. And so what we did here is essentially brought in auroral data. Can you read that um, right here? So we added essentially auroral um, data uh, and, and that significantly improve the spatial distribution of GNSS. So you could actually see, in fact, as the team looked at the auroral data, they could figure out, it's just like AI, when it tries to recognize a face, it knows, right? It can figure out what's a nose, what's a mouth, what's a chin. It kind of looks for edges, even without telling it. Simply by giving it data, it figures it out with 
the data from oral images, it actually figured out structures that are contributing to spatial um, component of GPS distribution. These are being written up and will shortly be available actually um, on the frontierdevelopmentlab.org website. This kind of gives you a chart on the details of what the team did, what kind of tools they use, not going to really uh, walk you through that. I kind of gave you the highlight. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. This is the paper that I just talked about um, that came out last week. And this is, this is actually really pretty cool. This is utilizing Solar Dynamics Observatory. And last year, what the team did, they asked the question. In Solar Dynamics Observatory, we have three um, instruments. Uh, extreme variability experiment has three sensor components. One of those sensors malfunctioned in 2014, but that's also a pretty significant component giving us that extreme EUV that really dumps its energy into the ionosphere, which causes drag. So you really want that number. So the team asked the question, well, can we take the imaging data from one of the other instruments on SDO and kind of really train the sensor data that is no longer there and validate it with the four years of data, and can we then produce a virtual sensor? And they were uh, remarkably successful, and that's why the paper came out. And what it also showed is that this neural net uh, application did significantly better than physics-based models, because we were always, we've been applying physics-based models, you know, inversion of DEM and all that. And, and so the team actually compared that and carried that through. So this, this is, um, oops. This is, so they, they are basically taking these nine filters and uh, putting it through the pipeline of neural net and then producing the sensor data. Uh, this, this, is, this is really kind of very remarkable. I mean, it, it's like, imagine you've got an orchestra playing and at some point, for some reason, you know, partway through the, um, Orchestra, one of the musicians, say, playing the violin, just stopped and walked off. Could you know enough about the way that music was playing, basically, to fill in the gap and recreate what you think that musician would have played if that musician was still in the chair? That's kind of sort of what this team did. We now have a tool that can give us EUV sensor measurements. But it's, it was, it's just one thing it has shown. What it has done much more is opened up the possibility of many such ideas, and, and they have followed through. And it's not just for heliophysics. We can apply this um, anywhere in any mission. Um, so I think I'm going to run out of time uh, this is another cool topic, the one in quad charts. I'm not going into details because this is being written up and you'll have that uh, available to you shortly. But here, the question was asked, can we take a different resolution magnetic field, you know, starting from Solis all the way to HMI today, spanning about 40, 50 years, and create a high resolution global magnetic field. And this team has successfully demonstrated that. Now, you know, and I'm just saying it and I'm not going to go through the process, but in the process we learned the information content in low resolution data. In the process we learned the compression that can be allowed to our data. So now think about creating missions for future where you can really make your instrument smaller, you can compress your data better, there's just any number of applications that you can take from here. This is another one, again, using the same solar dynamics observatory data. When a data set is AI prepped, 
you can apply all kinds of ideas to it because you don't have to do the data wrangling. And in this case, what, what they did is they said, okay, can I create a synthetic image from by using a couple of the SDO uh, EUV uh, data and produce a synthetic one? So we have nine filters. Do we always have to fill nine filters? Well, they demonstrate that we don't, that we can very accurately actually create synthetic filters. Um, they did an auto calibration on board. So for SDO, we have to fly, there's an underflight of rocket to calibrate the UV data because UV data actually degrades over time. And they have again taken imaging data to show you can do onboard auto calibration. So that, that it's, it's really, really very cool. Let's go quickly to can AI help here on Earth? There are just so many examples and most of these um, topics were basically uh, dealt with by um, Earth Observation Group with FDL uh, Europe. So, so this is, I'll show you, I think this is a movie. Uh, so the, you can watch this quickly. I just wanted to show that because I probably don't have time to go through each one of these slides in terms of what they did, but you know, they kind of developed tools for uh, flood prediction, utilizing um, essentially uh, synthetic radar aperture data. So even when you have cloud, you're getting data and you can actually create inference models and give it to emergency uh, responders. Um, this is uh, essentially uh, looking at mapping the informal settlements of 1.8 billion human beings who live in temporary living conditions. And this was a, a topic uh, undertaken with UNICEF. And this is, again, looking at data reflection from, I think, rooftop. I, let's see. I'm going to only go to a few other slides to make my point, um, I think I, I want to talk about the power of partnership, as I have emphasized this all throughout my talk. Uh, Google Cloud is playing a very important role in hosting our data and providing the compute time, along with NVIDIA, Intel, IBM. Uh, we are working hand in glove, and that, that's like amazing. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely critical, without which we really can't undertake the topics we are undertaking. In a nutshell, this is what you have for um, frontier development. You have research talent, you have challenge plus data, and you have capital plus capacity. You know, the combination of all of these sort of creates a culture and especially in the Silicon Valley where you feel anything is possible. And so far, the topics we have undertaken uh, have been remarkably successful. Um, AI is a very powerful tool, but at the end of the day, I think I would want to bring you back to where I had started. Remember, it is just fancy statistics, and we are actually being to able, able to pare down and look at, in our images, what aspect of the images are playing, are playing a big role in the inference model. We are delving deep into that. 
This is my last slide, and this is something I came across very recently, a statement uh, made by Stephen Hawking, and I want to read this. I think the 24th century will be the century of complexity. We have already discovered the basic laws that govern matter and understand all the normal situations. We don't know how the laws fit together and what happens under extreme conditions. There is no limit to the complexity we can build using these basic laws. And I'm kind of that's where we are. And so I kind of propose a grand challenge by experimenting with our data and AI is integration of the knowledge provided by the vast amount of data collected by NASA, and I would say NASA and all other partner agencies for the Earth system, the heliophysics system, the solar system, and the universe beyond, coupled with theoretical and computational models to understand and predict the behavior of the world we live in. Thank you.